So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Robert Franke from Likat in Rostock, uh, and together with my colleagues uh, Schaubig Das from the University of Antwerp uh, and Adam Slabon from Stockholm University, I welcome you to uh, edition number eight uh, of the Sustainable Chemistry Lecture Series. And uh, as we have already announced, uh, today's focus will be on the utilization of biomass and waste uh, for making interesting chemistry. So we have uh, two excellent guest speakers from this field uh, on board uh, who will share their expertise and their research results uh, in this field. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Markus Antonietti from the Max Planck Institute of Colloids and Interfaces in Potsdam here in Germany. And our second guest, Erwin Reisner from the University of Cambridge uh, in the UK. Uh, before uh, we start, I have some general remarks. Uh, first, uh, our SCLS series will continue, of course. The next event will happen in October, probably late October. Uh, the schedule and the date is not yet uh, finalized, uh, but we will uh, make the announcement soon. Uh, this will be provided in the social networks and on the EU CHEMS website. Uh, second, I would like to thank EU CHEMS and uh, KVCV, the Royal Flemish Chemical Society, for supporting uh, this event series. And a special thanks goes, of course, again to Thomas Franken, who's permanently supporting us uh, uh, technically in the organization of these events. And finally, uh, there's one further remark regarding the discussion, which usually follows our talks. Um, I would ask all the participants of, uh, of this workshop to either post the questions into the chat uh, or use the Q&A box at the bottom uh, of the app application uh, for posting questions uh, to the speakers. And this can be done either during or after the talk. So that being said, uh, I hand over now to Adam, who is going to introduce our first speaker. Yes, hi, Please. it's a great pleasure. Uh, thanks, Robert. It's a great pleasure to introduce today to you, uh, Professor Marcus Antonietti, and I would briefly introduce his CV to you. So Professor Antonietti was born in 1960 in Mainz. He obtained his uh, high school certificate from in the same city in 78. And then he enrolled into university to study actually chemistry, physics, and also some philosophy. Eventually, it became chemistry, where he obtained his master degree, or previously called Diplom, in uh, 83. And then he continued his PhD studies, or he started his PhD studies on polymer chemistry with Hans Zilescu. And it took him, I think, around two years and one month to graduate with his PhD studies with distinction. He then stayed further at the University of Mainz to start an independent career uh, towards his habilitation, which he obtained, I in 1990. Um, and soon afterwards, he was um, uh, promoted to associate professor, Hochschule assistant at the University of Mainz. But he stayed there only until uh, September 91. And then at the age of, I think, 31 years, he became full professor at the University of Marburg. And two years afterwards, he moved uh, because he was appointed the director of the Max Planck Institute of colloid chemistry, uh, and also at the same time, professor, full professor at the University of Potsdam. Marcus Antonietti has won many, many, many prizes. I cannot mention all of them. I would just pick uh, the recent ones, maybe in this case. I would start with the Bundesverdienstkreuz of Germany. This is the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, which is being uh, awarded by the president of the state. Um, he also got the Liebig Medal of the German Chemical Society, the Staudinger Award of the German Chemical Society. He is also an external member of the Swedish Academy of Engineering. Uh, he also holds an honorary doctorate from Stockholm University, which he got in 2011. Then he also got the Glinia Wittig Award of the French Chemical Society. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, I think the most recent prize is the ERC Synergy Grant, which you have won in this year. And in last year, you won for the second time the ERC Senior Excellence Grant. Um, Marcus Antonietti has, had, has promoted over 200 PhD students and around 60 co-workers from his group hold now positions as professors at other universities. Uh, Marcus Antonietti is one of the most cited chemists I checked Last week, I was, was around 145,000 citations. And this is also reflected in his wide research interests. Um, in polymer chemistry, biomimetic materials, carbon materials, porous uh, polymers, electrocatalysis, artificial photosynthesis, metal-free catalysts, and sustainable chemistry in general. Um, 
I think I have named all the awards, uh, maybe one of the awards which you obtained at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, you also obtained the Adolf Todd Scholarship, and also you also got the uh, prize, the gold medal of the Macro Group in the UK. With this, I would like to introduce, yeah, to give the floor to our guest speaker, Marcus Antonietti. Today, he will speak about reinventing chemistry to open the possibility to global sustainability goals based on biomass. Marcus, the floor is yours, and we are all looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you very much, Adam. I have to say, all what you said just means that I'm old. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, I love sustainability, and sustainability, I think, is the most important thing yeah, we have to do. And after my talk, I hope that you will see that. I'm very passionate about that, and it's an urgent matter. So, but I think this is not in this sense in this audience. So let's start the talk. So this is the title, Reinventing Chemistry, because I will tell you essentially that chemistry, as you know, it will not exist anymore in 10 years. I'm quite sure about that. Reason is manifold, but it's mostly economic, of course, and ecology. Yeah. Well, we brought our planet in a rather miserable, oops, uh, what is happening now? It worked in a second, ah, slow. And this is maybe the most pressing issue. This is, of course, the climate recording. And uh, it ends 2019, since, but you see, we were really overdoing our CO2 production. And I see no change in the curve. It's essentially still an exponential function. But there are more local things because CO2, of course, is invisible. And this, for instance, is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, 150 million tons of plastic waste swimming around, killing animals and everything. And I know that this is human misbehavior and we cannot put it on chemistry, but it's put by people onto chemistry. And of course, we have to change that. You can go to local things. You walk along the Danish or the Swedish coastline and you see fishes and birds mistake plastic for food. It starts already at the beginning of the food chain, yeah. And of course, this has to change too. And even at the very small scale, yeah, everywhere you can read and read and read. China bans, AU bans, yeah. So obviously the only thing which is in need in the mind of politician is to forbid something. However, of course, we have to change. And this is of course the task for the current audience. And this is, I think, why all of us are doing sustainable chemistry. Let's go back to that because we started the biggest experiment in 2019. And usually I do that with an audience uh, interview. Corona came and we did not take international air flights anymore. Industrial production was down by 40%. Most of the cars, at least in Germany, were not riding too far. So we were really saving, saving, saving energy. So it was a dreamland for all people believing that this change uh, is good enough. And of course, now I can ask you, what do you think happened with this curve? And for that, of course, you have to hack the original curve, but you see 200, 420, and this is 415. So carbon dioxide increased more than ever. So be aware that the corona crisis amplified the CO2 problem. And if you now wonder yourself, yeah, this is maybe then an education and tolerance, and it's essentially the internet and our data use. So every cent we ever saved with diode lightning, with more efficient cars is wasted now in the internet. The internet is the biggest uh, energy sink of the world, yeah? And this is why I say every generation has its own disease, yeah? Our grandparents were driving crusade ships. I'm driving a turbo diesel, but the young generation is sitting in the internet and every hour of streaming, there was a day where we had TV is 400 grams of CO2 per hour of streaming. Yeah, one hour Netflix, and these are the official data and down below, if you later load down this talk, yeah, this is everything documented in nature and carbon brief. Yeah, is 0.8 kilowatt hour. And in German electricity mix, which means a lot of sustainable energy is still 400 grams CO2. What does it mean? If you have a green modern family, uh, mama is doing home office, papa is streaming sports. Yeah, the kids are in, in homeschooling and in, of course, multiple parallel internet games. 
this type of use is taking 1800 kilograms of CO2 every year. So please guys, be careful with accusations. Yeah, In the very end, it's not your computer, it's just what we sink into the data infrastructure. Bitcoin, we don't have to talk about. This is indeed, you see, indeed, uh, Bitcoin alone is easily beating Norway, Switzerland, and Denmark together. Yeah, and this is complete bullshit, of course, but wherever human society has the possibility to do something like that, they will do it. And it's so all the data are human behavior, and this is nothing you can change so easily as maybe thought. Yeah, this is the greater answer. Yeah, in the very end, you see, this is one of my co workers. Yeah, the end is near. But of course, it, this is not why we took studies of 30 years in natural science. Yeah, And again, long before, it's a personal statement, sustainability was called sustainability. I already found out that the only group of people who can change indeed something is chemists, biologists, and engineers, because our science is on changes. Yeah, Politicians can only set frame conditions Yeah, or define money, but the solutions has to be in our mind. And of course, it's always good to cite the Encyclopedia Britannica. And they say the chemistry is the science that deals with properties, composition, and the structure of substances, the transformations they undergo, and the energy that is released or absorbed during the processes, which essentially means CO2 is our business. We can do that. Yeah. So again, the, the, the pledge for tolerance, yeah, stop accusing people, yeah, but do something, yeah, and as essentially we can do. And we only have to reconsider every step of chemistry. We have to go to sustainable molecules, as little fossil as possible, but we also have to invent carbon negative processes, which means we have to lower the CO2. And this means carbon negative products because something, uh, someone has to pay for that and it will be the customer, of course. So this introduced my agenda. So I will tell you something very big, which you never see. Then I will talk a little about bio refinery. And then of course, because I like it, I will present a little creative destruction because I will destroy polymers and make good products out of that. So let's analyze the CO2 problem because before you start working, you analyze something and be aware that the world crude oil production is seven cubic kilometers. Yeah, and it's a value of 1,700 billion US dollars. Yeah, so this is a lot. Yeah, and this, is, of course, creates the CO2. Yeah, by the way, only 7% of this is going into chemistry. Most of them is really going into fuels. Yeah, and um, we don't expect any change of that because as long as there is oil, someone will buy it, even if it's not Sweden or Germany, then it's China. Yeah. So what we have to do, of course, on this scale, we have to uh, invent a CO2 diminution technology, and sh it should be not more than 10% of the value of a product. And this is more psychology because people are ready to pay a bonus of 10% or compensate for 10%. So clean up after the party is allowed to cost 10%, not more, yeah, than the party. And this is... So the number we have to fix, this is our site condition, yeah? Then also something ugly, and as I'm a physical chemist, yeah, uh, this is something never mentioned and never uh, even always forgotten in engineering analysis. CO2 in the atmosphere is extremely dilute. So it's 420 parts per million. And if you remember the second law of thermodynamics, I can calculate the entropy value of this dilution which in the very end means uh, it's an incredible number of entropy. So if you now go through the techno-economic analysis, you will see indeed that we have to spend about 170 giga euro. Yeah, even at optimized efficiency in mankind is not good in entropy machines. So in the very end, this is more expensive. We will never be able to collect the CO2 from the atmosphere because there's second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, so be aware of that. All these nice collectors you see, this is window dressing. Yeah, it, this cannot work because there's this famous gibbs helmholtz equation or gibbs helmholtz boltzmann equation. There's a solution and this is why we say biomass because plants have exactly the same problem, of course, and they are eating CO2. Yeah, 
So if you check for the world biomass production, it's 60 gigatons of carbon, so which is 15, 15 times bigger than, and we always see only the energy, but the poor plants always do entropy work. Yeah. So in this entropy work of the plants, we always forget about, but if you want to treat the CO2 problem, don't focus on diluted CO2, focus on collected CO2, which is of course plant biomass. Yeah. And again, all these numbers you can read later and you will see that the energy content of biomass is not even enough to feed the internet. But indeed the collection work plants provide is a key step in solving the CO2 problem. So this is our task after some analysis, chemically fix the carbon from biomass to a modification while you have to return the phosphor and the nitrogen to the cycle, these are rare elements and we should give them back. Yeah, it's only for seven gigatons. This is twice the amount of oil. This is exactly the amount of agricultural side products. So I'm not telling you to run into the forest and collect pine needles. This is only what we throw away within our food production. Yeah, and if gigatons are too much, yeah, we have seven giga humans on the planet. So it's one ton per year and person. So each of you has to collect one cubic meter of biomass and turn it into a product. And this sounds much better because then you know we have millions of farmers helping us and doing that. Yeah. However, I, I promised you a product on that scale. Yeah. And you see seven gigatons is too much for chemistry. It's uh, two orders of magnitude bigger than chemical industry. And Again, I will surprise you, there is a product we need on such a cell and it has a lot of benefit, yeah? And for that, and this is for YouTube, I had to draw it myself. I have to give you some numbers. So in the upper corner, you find the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and all is calculated in, in carbon units is 870 gigatons, it's a lot, yeah? Land biomass is only 550 gigatons. So build as many trees as you like. This will be not enough. Yeah, it's the wrong scale. Yeah. And then you see something else. Soil only. Soil is twice the carbon content of the whole land biomass. So soil carbon is the attractive target. And soil really just as the top 10, 20 centimeter layer, you call fertile soil. And everything which is black, of course, in soil is a carbon product. Yeah. So this is the thing what we want to address is this ah the site calculation yeah i told you that we have 60 gigatons or per year of carbon bound in trees and of course as we now know the numbers it means 30 ppm per year 28.6 ppm per year this is the theoretical speed biology can cure the atmosphere the theoretical recovery rate which indeed means we're on a good side, there's hope, yeah? Because the seven gigatons per year, I talked about the side products, this is 3.3 ppm per year. This is more than the increase we do at the moment. So the scale is correct, there's hope, hooray, yeah? Not new, yeah, indeed already in the Paris Convention, and most of you are too young to know that, yeah? And I recommend this web page, the French state de defined this, task yeah indeed french agriculture could compensate for the system and the people said we have to do that there's an initiative but there's no clear, clear idea how to do that yeah we solve another problem and this is the in french so the well world food association of course the other way around in french yeah and you see the black stuff is fertility and wherever you see red spots, yeah, these are the places where soil quality is lowered in a speed that it's dangerous. So China, if they don't change something, will die in 30 years of missing food. And this is, of course, why they buy farmland in uh, Africa and do the same mistakes. This is the vanishing jungle in the Amazonas basin. This is the over farming in, uh, in the US. All these places need this black stuff product. So with the seven gigatons, and believe me, this land area is too big for seven gigatons. Uh, we could reactivate our soil fertility 
and secure food. And this is the reason why I say every product needs a market and this market is big enough. So the second pledge for tolerance and not uh, superiority of Western culture, this idea was invented a number of times in Indogenic cultures. And these are the so-called Terra Preta Indians and their settlements in the jungle indeed are green spots in the jungle. It sounds strange, but you may have, might have an idea with the pictures. This is typical jungle soil, it's ferrous soil. And if you plant corn or mice on it, you see it does not grow because in essentially it has no ability to hold water and nutrients. These guys about, well, 1000 years ago, they died out 500 years ago. So it's sustainable, the whole thing. Yeah, uh, changed the soil completely by adding a polymer called humic matter. And you see after 500 years, if you plant mice without fertilizer on the soil, it grows. This is the, the role indeed humic matter does have for soil and it keeps the, the minerals, it keeps the water, it does not leach out. And this is what these Indians found. Engineering those days was of course not steel manufactured. This is a double bubble reactor. It's a hole in the soil because of the pressure Yet it was uh, lined with clay. You have to keep the product of course on the inside. And here you see leftovers of this time. This head is mobile. It's the fill in ventile, so to say. And it's at the same time an overpressure valve to keep the whole reaction anoxic. So no oxygen, it's a type of fermentation conversion, yeah, but also chemical conversion and the exclusion of oxygen. Yeah, this is how it works. And this is how they did it, yeah. We repeated that in around 2007, and we reinvented something very old, Friedrich Bergius, Nobel laureate, in his habilitation letter, already described all this chemistry. So he said, he called it coalification. So he wanted to know how coal and oil came onto this planet. And he found out that wet plant materials, not dry coaling, can be heated and we get all the goodies because it's a solution chemistry. So please, there are two types of qualification, fire qualification, which is physics, and water qualification, which is full of the rules of chemistry as we know it. The structures you made are beautiful. So you see to micrometer, this is a monodisperse carbon emulsion. These are rods, yeah, fibers, which are very conductive. This is a sponge, the pore size is 30 nanometers. And of course, this is the wet dream of any catalyst researcher, because this is what you want as a heterogeneous support. And all that made from biomass for a price level of about 20 cent per kilogram, yeah? This was all ideal biomass. Even in Germany, we have a lot of leftovers. So we have biodiesel, the straw, no one wants to eat it, 20 megaton side products, sugar beets. This is simply that we take the sugar, but no one takes the sugar beets and so on. The orange peels are in Brazil, but this is calculated on the base of German or orange juice uh, consumption. So we have enough of that. And indeed in 2010, we built a big, big, big machine. As you see, this is our vessel. It's an 800 liter container. Yeah. And I, this is of the big garage, so like a truck garage. Yeah. And it does indeed 5,000 tons per year. It's a continuous process. And to illustrate continuous processes, you see, this is one kilogram per second. And because it's loud, I will stop it here. It's done, and we did it. Those days, indeed, we had problem with marketing because no one wanted to pay for that. It was too early. You can be too early even for sustainability in the market. Something else came in between. And this is, of course, a much more refined approach because I learned about the islands of Scotland. Yeah? So in the north of Scotland, yeah, they have the same artificial soils. So this here is man-made. Yeah? It's essentially made of calcium carbonate and kelp. Here you see still the kelp, yeah. And even after 8,000 years in this case, it's an equilibrium and it's a black soil. It's called Macher, yeah. And it's advanced polymer chemistry, yeah. And these guys indeed with a lot of time 
synthesize humic matter by mixing calcium carbonate and biomass. So this is the type of simplicity, of course, we want. This is base splitting, and it's called hydrothermal humification because you will see in no chemical means the product is easy to differentiate from humic acid. Yeah. This is humines. The very end is the chemistry. It's alkaline base splitting. Yeah, and in the very end, it condenses to such a structure. The exciting thing with this polymer is mankind never made such a good polymer. Yeah, it's poor accidental, but it's a pH buffer. And of course, you know, it's an advantage for biology to live in a constant environment. Yeah, it's one acid group per thousand mass units. So it means these COH groups are there quite often. It's a very good buffer. It's a redox buffer, 0.5 moles of electrons per kilogram. If you want to have that expressed in a lithium battery, this is 30% of a lithium battery. Yeah. So it's a really damn good redox buffer. And believe me, biology lives from the buffering of redox. It's iron binding, water binding, oil binding. It binds practically everything. It's an amphiphilic polymer. And this, of course, is the main actor we want to make in seven gigatons. Yeah. This is a little what you do, of course. So this is pyrolysis, MS. Yeah, this is solid state NMR. So all the things you can do and on a good university. Yeah, and you come up with certain plots which are typical. This is natural humic acid. They're protein based, polysaccharide based, and this is artificial humic acid. And you see, indeed, we have more aromatics, and we have indeed more lipids because we wanted in this case to make the product like that. Uh, so this is the type of analysis typical in soil chemistry. Brandenburg is a sandy land and plants don't grow there. I'm a gardener. So what we indeed do is we took the sand, we added the humic acid, and this is called conjugation in pharmaceutical industry. So it's essentially applying a multi-layer of humic acid on any grain of salt. Yeah, and what you see here is a typical picture. So this is a former grain, and this is how the humic acid sticks on the surface. It's an amphiphile, as I said. And this is, of course, where salts are bound, where life is bound. And in these channels, all the action takes place. This is a molecular understanding in black and white language of soil. Yeah, this is analysis. So we have extremely good uh, nutrient recovery. Yeah. So again, black soil has a lower value of potassium binding, but a higher value of phosphate binding. And this artificial soil, which is 0.5 per mil in sandy soil, it beats black soil. And then, of course, you go to planting experiments. In our case, these are done in China. These are rice seedlings. No, these are corn seedlings, sorry. And you see, indeed, the plant uh, is, is very, very happy that the control is grown with crystal fertilizer. All that is bio, and you see indeed bio nutrition, in this case, makes the plant even more happy. Yeah. This is the wonder, because of course I have students and they measure the total organic content and they measure the total organic content after treatment. This is dissolved organic content, this is total organic content. We added 0.4 per mil, and you see the soil has increased by 2% in carbon. This is a biological level of a factor of 70, which means for every ton of carbon we added, the soil bound 70 tons of carbon. And of course, no one could have expected that, but this is the reason why, meanwhile, I'm very confident that we can save the planet because biology helps you by a factor of 70. The marker here, and this is a soil chemistry marker, is a fluorescence. It's a humic like fluorescence. And you see it. this growth of biomass is humic, growth of humic like biomass. So it's an autocatalysis. So to say, humic acid creates the formation of more humic acid. There are no wonders, of course. It's essentially biology. Yeah. So we still believe in the preservation of elements and the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, and uh, you make, of course, very complicated uh, parallel gene testing, and you find indeed that the actor here is a Cupria Vidos Necator, a special universalist of the early days of evolution. So, this guy is presumably two billion years old, 
and he essentially took the conditions he found, did some photosynthesis, even because this guy can even do photosynthesis and be aware that bacterial photosynthesis is older, that plant photosynthesis and by orders of magnitude more efficient, he run the show. Yeah, this is the gene pool we find the most. Yeah. This has practical applications already. So what you see here is in-farm. In-farm is vertical gardening, so to say. They're producing fresh herbs and salads in the city. And first generation was with crystal mineralizers. If you take our technology, you can produce bioquality and such things with the same effort. So we essentially get rid of. And if you go for bigger things, this is what you call Singapore 2. So this is, vision, is a vision, but they build it currently. So all these things keep the high skyscrapers uh, auto-cooled. And this is real, though this already exists. This is the future. And this is a vision, urban farming in the very end. And for all that, believe me, you cannot dig out somewhere the soil and take it out from nature. All that relies on a technology as our technology that you create fertile soils and put them along with the building operations. Let's go refining because th this part is over. We are still working and you can ask questions, but I told you something about the 7% problem. Yeah. So we learned already there's enough site biomass in the world. We're using a so-called top cut for patchouli oil and the stranger things. Yeah. We throw away most of it. 90% of all biomass we farm is thrown away as a side product. And I already talked about the base cut, which means in the very end, fertility, humic matter, cellulose, fertilizer, we can do all that. But we have to focus also here because the future chemical industry will need raw materials, will read platform molecules. And by the way, the scale is like that, that only 7% of the biomass, we have to be able to use them as static products for chemical industry, because this is the scale. Why am I so sure that classical chemistry will die? Classical chemistry lives from oil refining and they take 7% of the goodies. But for instance, the 50% heavy crude oil is entering crusade ships. And if the crusade ships because of consumer behavior will not run with this shit anymore, yeah, you cannot pay chemistry anymore because then you're left with this untreatable stuff and the only thing you can do is pump it back, but it means chemistry will turn six times more expensive. Very easy mathematics, everything depends on everything. So this is why I see that oil industry is in a bad shape. Well, this is what we do. And this is the espresso refinery. We do everything in water because biomass only dissolves in water and some strange solvents. And this is done, of course, in every espresso machine because uh, you do, well, temperatures expressed in bars. And 10 bar gives good espresso. If you go to the south, they say 16 bar. It's a temperature you can extract cafe beans with water. And, and indeed, at 16 bar, water is a little like THF because of the change in dielectric constant. Yeah, these are molecules you can make and you know them and you can guess where they come from. Yeah, and in the very end, I will present a little on hydrothermal reforming. Lactic acid is a good molecule because you can make it very easily from waste. Yeah, it's again a part of the hydrothermal humification. And what you do here is in two minutes reaction time, it's a flow reactor at 250 degrees centigrade, you turn carbohydrates, glucose in this case, to 28% yield into lactic acid. This is good business, damn good business. And it's not fermentation because it takes only two minutes. The machines are small, yeah. Of course, this is thus just the beginning. We have optimized the reaction conditions, the base, and all the things you can do in a flow reactor very quickly. Here I report already 57%. If the pattern is out, I'm allowed to tell you about 80%. So lactic acid can be done from a 100 euro product in high yields. The chemistry is a retroaldol splitting. So we do exactly the inversion or what muscles on the hard work do. Yeah, we split over here. You get two C3 units and both of them are lactic acid. This is a dreamy reaction 
of green chemistry because it comes with 100% mass yield without any loss. No leaving groups, everything. You have side products because you split, in this case, chemistry, not enzymes, at every position, not only at the 3 3 position, but still, if you use the right base, you cut mostly at the right position. Yeah. Water as a solvent comes with a lot of problems, yeah, because oil industry and all catalysts were optimized for organic solvents. And believe me, hot water kills everything. Platinum copper dissolves in hot water. And everything, for instance, we know about hydrogenation, hydrides don't live in water. Metal hydride bonds don't like water. So everything, you really have to reinvent chemistry for that, yeah. I found 66 papers on water hydrogenation, yeah, but it's demanding ligands, and there indeed the organic chemistry is more expensive even than the platinum inside. Yeah, so I really want to make it simple. That's my deal. Yeah. This is when we invented kitchen chemistry. It's the ultimate consequence of green chemistry. So we do all our catalysts in the kitchen with kitchen tools. Even school kids are allowed to join because this is not a lab anymore, it's a kitchen. And we do the chemistry as haute cuisine. This is the perversion of an old man, I admit. So don't take that too serious. Yeah. This is how it looks. This is a catalyst productions, two of my graduate students. In the very end, we do catalysts as noodles. This is a noodle machine. Yeah. And of course, we apply a pizza oven at the end at 450 degrees. You would hardly do that and burn the whole structure because our catalysts are carbon supported nickel. It's a heterojunction catalyst and I have no time to talk about it. I have a time to show a video. This is how... <laughs> noodle production and the final... Ah! What happened? It me. Oops. Okay, let's go full screen again. You see the little chips, these are the catalysts, yeah. And this is the nickel catalyst, and we do now diverse things. And again, we have acid catalyst, base catalyst, hydrogenation catalyst, oxidation catalyst, addition catalyst, and all work in water. And this is indeed, we're still, it's a long way, much to do, but we transferred catalyst, heterogeneous catalyst into water, yeah? This is how a flow reactor looks like. So you see, it's nothing but an HPLC column. We don't spend a lot of money. So we buy everything in parts and construct it ourselves. Yeah, this is a poster, which I forgot inside. And here, for instance, you see how we destroy lignin. So lignin is one of these famous products which is a good aromatic source. And you see, if I do use this catalyst at 150 degrees centigrade, I can completely disintegrate it in a mono and di aromatic compounds. Yeah, this is a hydrogenative splitting yeah, of nickel onto titanium nitride in this case, and it's quantitative in the flow reactor. So we have all these nice aromatics to our hands. This is how it looks like, it's explosion. And you already see classical catalysis, our catalyst, our, our catalyst is really very selective and very sensitive. And this is now 2D, of course, uh, 2D HPLC MS, yeah. And you see every little guy is a part of the biomass. It works also with lignosulfonate, which is a real killer. So we can even take Kraft lignin but of course, everything which is stable against water is also stable against sulfur. So this comes automatically with the idea to develop a functional tolerant catalyst system. Biofuels, yeah. Okay, we have batteries everywhere, but you know that airplanes and ships will always rely on biofuels. So what could, could we do with biofuel, yeah? And again, one of these questions, which is the most sustainable car? And I talk here really, this is 1960s, of course, about everything, which is battery, construction, and getting rid of the car again, 
And the answer is rather brutal, except that this left thing, Renault Alpine, uh, is using fuel. It, it's only 900 kilograms. It's much more fuel efficient. In the very end, you can construct and deconstruct it, which you cannot do currently with any electric car. So electric batteries, contrary to the propaganda, are not recycled at the moment. They burn the batteries and recycle the nickel, but this is not what we call as chemist recycling. Yeah, this is such a transformation, which is a good one. Yeah, this is indeed coming from wood, and here we focus on the hemicellulose products, and it's a two-shot reaction. The first one is an acid uh, dehydrogenation. The second is a acid dehydration, then a hydrogenation. And this is a wonder molecule because the potential efficiency is 93% of the energy of hemicellulose ends up in these molecules. The best bioethanol is doing only 50%. And the reason being, of course, is the yeast want to eat, wants to multiply, and distillation is an awful business. Yeah? Whereas this molecule is not water miscible, you can take it off of the water. Yeah? It has good octane number, and my chainsaw already worked with that by a sample we made, so everything is correct. This is no propaganda. Yeah? How to do that? Flow chemistry. This is now a two-step flow chemistry reaction. Yeah, And again, I accelerate a little because this is getting boring. Yeah, But in the very end, yeah, you see that after 17 minutes, the polysaccharide fraction has converted into two full, full molecules. So we keep, could not keep the reaction from doing this thing beside this thing. And together, they are over 80%. Yeah, and this is a diesel molecule, and this is a super gasoline molecule. Yeah, so both of them in principle can be used. A lot of work to do, optimization and so on. Flow chemistry is too intense because you can make a thousand reactions a day. Yeah. It's stable. It could be more stable, I have to admit. Yeah, and this is another thing, but uh, this is maybe a problem of the nickel, and we are currently working on that. So last point, I promised you something against the plastic patch. I have another four minutes and I'm perfect in time. Yeah, in spite of an introduction. Yeah, this is chemistry. We have to think from the cradle to the grave. Yeah, so we know how to make polymers and in all our life, we make them more and more stable. And this is why plastic battles will survive for thousands of years on the ground of the ocean. So what I want to have is exactly such a new cutter, polymer catalyst to cut polymers it will not contain rare metals, it will be sustainable. And can we invent such a polymer cutting catalyst? This is my group leader doing that. It's essentially only a biopolymer lignin plus a porogen. And then we oven condense it to a catalyst. And with a little trick, I'm not allowed to tell you, we make an acid catalyst of, of that. So what you see here is a carbon version of a zeolite. Why not zeolite? Zeolite dissolves in water. And believe me, dirty plastic is full of water, full of functionalities, full of food, and the zeolite dies in a few minutes when you do that. This is one of these enzyme-like things tolerating functionality. This is the characterization. So you see this is TPD. It has three acid peaks. The irrelevant peak is the middle peak for the reaction. And this is plastic waste, and the plastic weights after two hours of steering at 350 degrees above the ceiling temperature. Again, don't forget thermodynamics. Any, any decompolymerization below the ceiling temperature is a lie. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. But you heat it to 400, and it's vanished, and it has vanished into that. So polyethylene, you see, is turning into perfect icon fractions perfect alkan fractions. And the fact that I do not cheat, you see that the even and uneven to have one envelope. So, so making also in nature always prefers the even ones. We also have the uneven ones cutting, indeed, creates also the uneven ones. High resolution in one of the peak, alkane, alkan, alkadiane cycles. So many different products. But again, we want to use the 150 million tons of plastic weights to make at least something useful out of it. 
Yeah, polypropylene, more exciting because you have stereo, stereo isomers and much more opportunities. You see the same thing, but now you get 2 million products. And let's take, for instance, only this molecular weight you see. Uh, the double bond can be everywhere. The methyl groups can be everywhere. So we have as gazillions of isotopes, but it's the same molecule polymerizing uh, polyethylene and polypropylene. I'm at the end, and I hope I moved you a little, and I even have fired your enthusiasm for sustainable chemistry. Because I can promise you, all of us will have wonderful jobs. Industrial chemistry as such must be reinvented completely step by step, as long as we do not tolerate 50% of heavy crude, which we can not get rid of. It concerns processes, catalysts, products, fuels, polymers, applications, Everything is you. So it's fantastic for us. This crisis is fantastic for chemistry. Yeah. This is more a philosophical thing. Be open to non scientific knowledge because my biggest inspirations I got indeed when drinking a bottle of whiskey on an island in Scotland. And this is clearly non scientific knowledge. Yeah. And synthetic humic acid, as we do it, yeah, will allow synthetic soil management, terraforming. Yeah in the best sense, because we have to reform Terra, our Earth. Yeah. For the biorefinery, in such a process, we only have to take out 7% of the best of the goodies yeah, as chemicals. Yeah. I was not talking about new catalysts to keep the 45 minutes, but I was presenting you at the end a process for the controlled depolymerization on plastic waste. And this, of course, is my carry home messages. Yeah. Industry will grow. This will shrink, of course, but forestry, paper, microbiology, this biocide will grow and will have the same size necessarily as this arrow and sustainable economy. Yeah, biorefining, bioplastic, humic matter with 10 gigatons per year is indeed a lot of money. So we will triplicate our industry to run the planet accordingly, but I think it's good for everyone. So we will move from an oil chemistry to a carbon cycle chemistry. And this is a rather safe prediction. This is my hero. Uh, I'm not talking about Greta. Yeah, Greta is just like this girl. Yeah, so this girl indeed is Pandora. And Pandora is Greek and means the one gifted with everything. And you know the story, she opened the box. Yeah, and what came out are all the bad things on this planet, death, disease. So this is chemistry of the first generation. Be aware that you have to read to the end of the story because Pandora opened the box a second time and found hope. And I think this is what we also have to find. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Markus, for this excellent and inspiring talk and for showing us also that in every challenge there's a chemical opportunity for us. Um, I would start with some questions from the audience and I would open up with a question from Paul Anestas from Yale. Uh, Paul's writing, excellent talk, thank you. Please forgive me if you mentioned this point and I missed it. Are there any energy considerations for industrial applications of a humic acid technology that need to be considered? What about the energy balance? Does this make sense? This is a beautiful question. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, hello, by the way. Wonderful that you're in. No, every process occurring in nature spontaneously must be exothermic, must be downhill. And be aware that humic acid formation, so the degradation of biomass is a spontaneous process. It even fuels the life of bacteria. So we're on the safe side. The process is spontaneous. Yeah, this is the great thing. Everything you take from nature is spontaneous or with photo, but for photo, you will have Erwin Reisner in the next talk. We can go uphill, then we need light. But these processes occur in the dark, spontaneously, in a swamp, which means we are on the good side of energy. Good. Thank you for the answer. Uh, the second talk will go to Jayan Yuan. So Jayan is saying, great talk, Marcus. I noticed the big trouble to deal with CO2 into biocarbon. It's the energy cost. A technical question. What is your view on solar energy for the artificial CO2 biocarbon conversion? Not the classic photochemical, but HTC or similar processes. Oh, this is an excellent question. But here I really have to point off on the second lecture. 
Erwin Reisner, who I praise very much, we are talking back to back. This is the other option. We don't only have one arrow in reserve, we have two arrows and solar energy processes are the big thing to come. Yeah, it's nothing for Sweden, I fear to say, because you want to produce summer and winter. But it's something for Morocco and all the deserts. And there, indeed, I think it's a very good idea to use solar, even just solar heat, not only the light to run our processes. It's a matter of logistics, but I'm looking forward to Erwin to talk about all the power we can do on this side with the light. It's not my talk, Giant. Sorry to say this time. Thank you, Martins. Okay, more questions, I think. Uh, Leonard, I see you here. Yes, I, I'm happy to start. And, and hello, Marcus, and thank you for hello, being very nice, nice and, and uh, as always, a thought provoking uh, uh, talk. Yes, I, I, have, I have a more general question on the use of biomass because there is such a demand of biomass for a lot of, of, of uses today and it's growing rapidly. I mean, it's as you pointed out for fuel, feedstock for chemicals and also building blocks for materials. So how to find the balance here? So the most efficient, in particular from a, from a climate point of view. And, and I should also point out in Sweden, of course, there is a large debate about leaving the, 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 um, uh, the forest growing, not cutting it down in order to, uh, to act as a carbon sink. Okay, Lennart. So again, I will answer this question in a very non-Swedish way. And I'm, I, I it, it took me three years to find the data and I call many of the things as wrong belief or bullshit. Yeah. So what is the point? Paper industry, and these are the official number, is eating four gigatons of trees. So paper industry is as big. However, the product of this process is only uh, 500 megatons of cellulose. Yeah, We add l lumber, of course, and similar things. This process is super inefficient. Paper industry is running with 30%. I was observing a number of factories only entering in paper industry and valorizing their side products, which they can do now because they're more energy efficient, yeah, will solve all your problems. Yeah, we have a paper factory side by side. We are, we are going through the numbers. This is a 500,000 ton cellulose factory, yeah, but they're eating two megatons of trees and 1.5 million tons are there for free. If you don't like wood because it's so Swedish, yeah. Uh, sugar production in Brazil, one gigaton, one cubic kilometer of bagasse, which is just fired to distill the ethanol. You don't need heat, of course, in Brazil. Yeah, One gigaton, the same numbers are true for US, two gigatons, corn and all the side products. The American friends are talking about the two gigaton bioeconomy only based on side products. So when I gave you the seven gigatons at the beginning, this is without any change of the system, available biomass as site products, yeah? And this is why I say everyone who's pretending what you are saying has another target than facing the reality. Sorry to say that. So uh, thank you for clarifying it. I think I, I, I must say I, I'm quite close to, to, to your opinion in this point, uh, that, that efficiency is the key here. Yes, efficiency is the key. Yeah. Hey. Then a question from Schubeck, please Schubeck. Markus, very inspiring lecture. So those who work in sustainable chemistry or try to work on it, uh, I think you have provided us a lot of thoughts, a lot of foods actually, or foods for thinking. One more thing actually, I realized that whiskey is the cool thing for, let's say how to think or how to think exceptionally. Thanks for this point. However, <laughs> I have, <laughs> I have one question, and I also realized that now I should probably switch from beer to whiskey. So anyhow, my, my question is regarding this uh, plastic chemistry. So do you think that converting polyethylene and polypropylene to the monomer, do you think that can be a good option? Of course, I, I do agree with you that circular economy, we need to respect, we need to work on it, we need to get new molecules. But do you think that's also a good good option to convert polyethylene to ethylene, let's say? Well, indeed, if you look very carefully, uh, the medium range icons are much more valuable at the moment. Yeah, so people don't want to go down to ethylene. Ethylene is a rather cheap molecule. It is the thinking ethylene is typical petrorefinery. Yeah, 
I admit that this type of degradation only creates fuels which will fuel the old cars and the old economy. But be aware that we just if you just clean up the plastic patch in the Pacific, which is an entropy problem, yeah, you will have indeed the fuel for 10 million cars in on 10 years. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Marco. Thank you. Marcus, I also have a question. I would be interested to hear your opinion if it comes to CO2 reduction. What do you think for the future, like algae? Because they can kind of capture out CO2 quite fast. What do you think is the future for this technology, actually? Um, again, you see in my talk, and please distribute it, I always talked also about biology. I said chemistry, biology, and engineering. Yeah, And also biologists can create... We have a standard problem with photosynthesis of plants, which is the efficiency. It does not go over 0.3% over the year. This is, of course, bound to many things, one generation per year and so on and so on. Yeah, uh, algae can do indeed 6-7%. And again, even better are the, is the microbiome or microbes. So the very early pioneer uh, photosynthetic bacteria are incredible. Yeah, they're, they're, they're light eating machines. And I think indeed that if we have CO2 in, for instance, in collected streams, yeah, algae bioreactors can do it or microbial bioreactors can do it. Yes, indeed. But I'm not a biologist, so what to choose, I leave to my good friends in biology. Yeah, I'm just a side observer of biology. But yes, of course, biology is a way to convert CO2 with light into a high value biomass, which then will enter my machine, of course, because then I will buy it from you. Yeah. And because collection is the one thing and algae can collect, that's the point. Yeah. And conversion is the other thing. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, uh, one more question, Robert. I think I saw you. Yes. Uh, so I have uh, one rather specific question. Uh, this is a question from a catalysis institute regarding your hydrogenation catalyst. So maybe I have missed it. Maybe you can uh, repeat it once more. So what was the, the specific um, parameter of these catalysts which makes them more stable also in, in, under aqueous conditions? And the second question regarding these catalysts, what is the conductivity and could you, or electrical conductivity, could you also use them as cathodes for electrocatalytic hydrogenation? Uh, we never did catalytic hydrogenation. We, however, did the inverse. And indeed, the sustainable catalysts are as good in water splitting mm -hmm. as the best iridium and platinum catalyst, first. Mm -hmm. Second is a very specific answer, indeed. You have to move in your thinking from the hydride transfer, metal hydride mm -hmm. transfer, to the thing occurring in biology, which is the proton-electron transfer. Mm -hmm. And proton electron transfer occurs according to completely different means because you need an electron transfer, which is conductivity. But the proton transfer is an ionotronic operation. So you need an ion conducting environment and an electric conducting environment as an enzyme at the same time. And if you do that, you see it's a new paradigm in catalysts. Mm -hmm. Hydrogenations don't progress along hydride transfer. They progress along electron proton transfer or the other way around, inverse for the oxidation. And if you know that, you're in business immediately. It works. Okay. Thank you. But we have to talk independently. This is very specific. Adam, there is one question in the chat box. Oh, I did not see it. Sorry. Um, ah, from Sehi Butnik. Um, Thanks for the extremely interesting talk. Probably you can give a comment on the industrial scalability of the polyhydrocarbon splitting and mechanical stability uh, and long-term performance of the catalyst? Oh, this is a good question for the last question. I have not the slightest clue because we invented that one year ago. And industrial scaling, I'm not an engineer, is not in my hands. I know that indeed it survives uh, our steered, but you've seen we are doing everything still in glassware, which means we are really still far from engineering. I can give you turnover numbers, turnover frequencies, lifetimes. I can tell you that it, it practically cannot be destroyed. We did even a wild type plastic, which means we have something called the, the Gelbe Sack, the yellow bag in Germany. Yeah, and I took this stuff. It does not care on water and food, but indeed all the side products stay in the reaction flask. And if you have 10% of sand and metal and count corks and all this uh, stuff, it stays in the reactor. So it's really an engineering problem we have to face next. And it's more the mechanical separation 
of the side solids from the catalyst than the degradation of the polyethylene. Okay, good, thank you. So with this, I think if there are not more questions, I would then close the Q&A session. Markus, I would like to thank you again for participating. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Talk. I Vast always love to talk to enthusiastic young people. Yeah, and you are the future, you know that. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. good. So with this, I would then give the word over to Shubik. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you, Marcus, for a very inspiring lecture and to, let's say, to start our program for today. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Erwin Reisner as the second speaker for today's seminar. So as usual, that we start with the brief introduction uh, or brief CV of our guest speaker. So Professor Reisner has studied in University of Vienna and received his PhD degree in 2005. And he did his research in the group of Professor Kepler. Followed by, by his PhD, he moved to MIT to join the research group of Professor Stephen J. Leopard. In 2008, he came back to Europe and joined the research group of Professor Fraser Armstrong in the University of Oxford. And in 2010, he joined as a lecturer in the University of Manchester. Since 2017, he is the professor of energy and sustainability in the University of Cambridge. I mean, it's very clear that uh, he has earned a lot of awards, a lot of, let's say, prestigious grants, some of the names I'm going to mention. First, he has won the Science Award by State of Upper Aust Austria, Grammaticis Newman's Prize, a Newman Prize by the Swiss Chemical Society, Harrison Meldola Memorial Prize by the Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, European Research Council Consolidated Grant, Japan Society of Coordination Chemistry International Award for Creative Work, and very recently, Corda Morgan Prize from the Royal Society of Chemistry. He's also the director of UK Solar Fuel Network, coordinator of UKRI Cambridge Creative Circular Plastic Center, and he's the member of the editorial board of Angovantashimi. So it's very clear that his scientific achievements are super impressive and the chemistry is very, very outstanding. So with this information, I would like to invite Erwin and Erwin, the screen is yours. Great, thanks a lot, Shubik, for the very kind introduction and also Robert and Adam to bring us together here. It's a real pleasure to be here and especially presenting also with Markus in this session. A really fantastic talk before. So let me just share my screen. Okay, that, that should be up. So my, my talk is, as Markus mentioned before, on solar approaches to sustainability. I've been interested in solar energy conversion, solar fuels for about 15 years now, and started off with more classical artificial approaches, or actually artificial photosynthesis approaches, um, but, but started to think in more, recently, more recent years to more general or broad ways um, for sustainable chemistry using solar light. And a lot is actually for me to figure out how to make solar energy conversion to produce sustainable chemicals a reality. Of course, we, solar energy has been very successful for photovoltaics or electricity generation with prices collapsing by or down to 20% in the last 10 years. But we still not, have not really an industrial way, a sustainable way to use solar energy to produce chemicals. And I thought that probably just water splitting or direct CO2 reduction may not be the first entry step and maybe actually going more to waste product or waste conversion may enable much earlier circularity approaches in this context. So this is a rather new uh, line of work for us. We probably started about five years ago, but it's growing very rapidly and I'm extremely excited about this. So I will just share our thinking on this work and just show a couple of examples. But before I really delve into the presentation, I will just give a bit of an introduction on photocatalysis and how to use sunlight to produce chemicals. So for solar fuel synthesis, um, in a simple approach, we look at semiconductor powders. In this case, you have sunlight that irradiates a semiconducting particle, or of course, this can also be an electrode. And what you do is you have a classical band structure. And in this case, we excite an, an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And then we have this energized or low potential electron that can be used 
to produce a fuel. And in this case, the simplest, I'm just trying to, to find my, my point, but I just work with this one. Um, we reduce protons to hydrogen. And in this case, since we constantly consume electrons, we need to replenish these electrons. And this is traditionally done by water oxidation to oxygen. And this is already the overall full water splitting reaction where we take water being oxidized to oxygen, releasing protons, and these protons then in an aqueous process can be used to reduce or produce, in this case, hydrogen. And always we need to keep in mind that these are two half reactions, so the oxidation and the reduction process. And also different from Marcus' talk before is in this case, now we have an endothermic reaction. So we need this energy input, and that's, of course, where sunlight becomes very handy, and we can use this uh, in our favor here. When we talk about solar energy, so this is just for you um, to realize without me going into any details. Unfortunately, we are not exposed to just a monochromatic light or a single wavelength, which would actually allow us to produce very high efficiency photocatalytic systems. But rather than we deal, of course, with the solar spectrum, which is shown here on the right. So this means it's very important that we really tune this band gap or the light absorber system to collect as much light as possible. So if we, of course, the band gap is too large, we lose a lot of the, the, the visible or the infrared region. If the band gap is very narrow, then we lose all of this high energy from the UV or blue light. So somewhere, the best way, somewhere in the middle, and it always ends up to be in the visible, which is the optimal region. That's why you always in the publications read about visible light responsive and visible light driven catalysis. And of course, in this case, what I just mentioned before, we have the thermodynamic requirement. So if we think about a single light absorber, we always need more energy than this 1.23 electron volts that you need for um, the water splitting reaction, taking into account also some kinetic losses. You look at much more like 1.6, 1.7 electron volts as a practical minimum. Um, what else needs to be considered for uh, water splitting or photocatalysis in this context is the kinetics and this mismatch of very fast photophysics and slow chemical catalysis. So many of these photochemical or the photocatalytic processes are very fast time scale, meaning picosecond to nanosecond time scale, if you just think about the photo excitation and excited states. But these catalysts, they turn over very slowly. So if we, if we think about hydrogen evolution catalysts or molecular systems, you, millisecond, second, um, or longer time scales are very common. So in order to be efficient, of course, all these excited states that are generated by the light absorption they need to be used to produce or do the chemistry that you'd like to see. And then ultimately, I've only shown the water splitting reactions so far, classical solar fuels reactions today, or I would say the classical mainstream, really would be also thinking about CO2 reduction. And again, with electrons sourced from water oxidation. So in this case, you can convert carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. But once you go into the carbon chemistry, um, which is the beauty of it. Of course, there's an endless possibility of products you can form, so practically endless. This means also other carbon fuels are of, of relevance here, just not just the easy, simple pure products as formic acid, but of course, as you develop more sophisticated catalysts, also alcohols, other oxygenates, hydrocarbons, etc. And of growing interest is also nitrogen fixation, where it would be brilliant if we could just reduce nitrogen to ammonia to find a sustainable alternative to the Haber Bosch process for fertilizer synthesis, for example, or to have a already nitrogen uh, ammonia, which is a hydrogen storage system. So this is more or less represents from a catalysis uh, point of view, the classical artificial photosynthesis um, reaction space with many groups, I would say probably thousand plus research groups active around the world today. So it's, 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 a, it's a buzzing area. But since I, I started this, I always was a bit puzzled by this water oxidation reaction. So that there's a clear argument for water oxidation. If you really want to make fuel on a global scale, and let's say use solar fuels to replace all of uh, the fossil industry, you need, of course, an extremely abundant source. And water is the most obvious. So it's, it's clearly an enormous justification. But I still think there are quite some niches, or maybe even larger than niches, um, where we can start thinking about replacing this, this water oxidation to oxygen. But before I come to this, maybe just a few limitations of water oxidation. So with water oxidation making oxygen, you look at actually quite a challenging catalytic, uh, challenging process. This means oxygen generation is challenging from a catalytic point of view, um, simply because you need to move um, four protons and four electrons, but also from a thermodynamic point of view. So this 1.23 electrons I mentioned before, that it's mostly so endothermic because this water oxidation is so demanding. 
then if you manage to achieve it, um, you form actually quite a reactive molecule in your system. So if you just think about, if you see, look at this picture here on the right, which is a photocatalytic system where we just shine light to a solution and some hydrogen bubbles form. If you co-evolve some oxygen, of course you form a knall gas, which is not ideal. So you have immediately an explosive mixture. But also reactive means um, it can easily start uh, forming a short circuit. So this oxygen can just diffuse to the reductive side and reduce oxygen instead of protons, which leads to inefficiencies. And when it does so, it often forms uh, oxygen radical species, which again can just decompose the catalytic process overall. So, and again, with the canal gas, you need separation. And ultimately, oxygen is of limited commercial value. Um, this may sound a bit strange at the times when we hear from places that run out of oxygen um, to treat patients. But of course, in the, in the big picture, oxygen, um, if there's not a pandemic, is not really a molecule you can make uh, a lot of money with. So that was the justification for us to start thinking about oxidizing substrates to other products um, with the idea to have this product, but also have a, a sustainable means to source electrons for fuel generation. So plotting this diff diff uh, differently and to justify this approach to bring value into the process, this is a very simple plot where we have on the y-axis scalability versus process value on the x-axis. And if we just start with water oxidation to oxygen, you can see the scalability is clearly a huge advantage, but we're not adding much to, an, to the overall process value. On the other extreme, of course, you can think about using organic oxidations to produce fine chemicals, uh, bulk chemicals. This would increase the process value quite dramatically, but then the scalability maybe on, on again, a relevant global scale to make a fuel is not there. So there would be this huge mismatch of this one pharmaceutical you wanna make versus hydrogen requirements to, to, to support a steel factory, for example. But maybe there's a sweet stock in between where we really look at organic waste streams and think about waste to mitigate waste, which is also value, or in fact, to convert this organic waste to organics, which have value. And also, as Marcus explained just before, there's a significant scalability aspect to waste, especially when we think about biomass waste, but also other streams. So this, the context of the talk today or how we got into this chemistry was really to think about solar driven chemistry with four components. The first is our substrate, waste polymers. And when I say waste polymers, again, that's mainly biomass and plastics in an aqueous solution with sunlight and the sunlight will drive a photocatalyst. And the idea is simply to convert all of these to a fuel. It will be mainly about hydrogen in this talk and then the co-generation of chemicals. And this, is chemistry that can be done under ambient temperature and pressure. So that's a, a significant advantage over thermal processes that require obviously heat or, or high pressure. So the question was how to get into this chemistry. We were interested, but didn't really quite know a starting point. So the, the people really who deserve credit here are Moritz Kündel and David Wakely in my group, who about five years ago started to think of, of ways to convert biomass. And the concept is here, and I've shown this before, can we oxidize biomass to the salt was just CO2 and source the electrons to reduce water to hydrogen? And our starting point was really looking at lignocellulose. And also here, this just continues from the theme of, of Marcos. We do not want to compete with agriculture. And in fact, we just want to use waste from um, agricultural production or other waste products that don't have another use. And this is, of course, where lignocellulose come in. It's a non-edible form of biomass. And it's also the most abundant form of biomass, so it also has a scalability aspect. The big issue simply is when you think about photocatalysis that's usually done in solution, um, it's extremely chemically inert and hardly soluble. So you, de you deal with a heterogeneous, semi-heterogeneous or um, soluble, ideally photocatalyst system in a solution, and then another solid. So how do you get a, an efficient interface? So how can you actually react this to, to have productive chemistry? Uh, and this is just a reminder how lignocellulose looks like. So we have this core, this crystalline cellulose, um, glucose polymer, hemicellulose, the amorphous component, and then this uh, polyphenolic um, lignin um, exterior. A few more words to biomass conversion and to put this in context with the classical overall water splitting I've shown before. So I mentioned water splitting is highly endothermic and I assigned this largely to the water oxidation um, process. But now we can replace water oxidation by glucose um, oxidation. And now this becomes huge in our thermodynamic favor. So it turns out if you just oxidize glucose to CO2, 
and convert this and use this to reduce protons, you're completely energy neutral. So delta G equals uh, almost zero. And that's great because now from a, from a, a photocatalysis de design a point of view, we have actually no restrictions anymore. So in principle, we can really go uh, to much um, higher wavelengths. Another interesting aspect is, in this case, if we look at this overall process, and this excited me right from the start, we look, we, we produce carbon dioxide. So this takes now, um, this depends now on your assumption. If we assume, well, which is the case, but if you take it into your calculations, that the biomass was grown from carbon dioxide, then actually you already have an energy, uh, a carbon neutral cycle. But there's something else happening now. CO2 is being concentrated in the system, right? We feed in the biomass. And if we have a closed reactor, we just accumulate CO2. So in fact, this allows us to operate under concentrated CO2. And we don't have an issue uh, where we have to capture carbon dioxide from the air. And this can be used very simply, for example, to capture CO2, to pump it underground with carbon capture and sequestration, which would then yield ultimately a negative CO2 balance. But for us, much more interesting is in fact to think about carbon capture and utilization. So with this concentrated um, CO2 inside our closed system, can we just couple this to CO2 chemistry and also show the co-production of carbon fuels or chemistry? And I will just show one example that we just completed after trying this for several years. And ultimately, of course, it's carbon chemistry. So in principle, we do not want to go and oxidize all the way to carbon dioxide. If we can just end up at interesting organics even better, and from CCU, we can hopefully also make other carbon products and not just simple, simple fuels. So it's, it's, I think it's a very rich um, platform to do sustainable chemistry. We just need to find ways to harness light and in particular to develop the right catalyst to do selective chemistry. So we were surely not the first to think about this. So this area of research, to my knowledge, goes back to 1980 when Kawai and Sakata reported exactly this process I've just shown, biomass oxidation to CO2, proton reduction to hydrogen. And when I talk about the historical contents, I re mean really meaningful polymeric substrates and not just dissolved um, sugar molecules or some glucose. So they really showed you can use all sorts of polymers uh, from cellulose, et cetera, and, and, and convert this to carbon dioxide. And following this pioneering work, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of publications, which are very nicely summarized by this review by Puga, which was a, a very useful starting point for us to show all sorts of different conversions. But all systems before studied relied on titanium dioxide as the light absorber and the platinum or at least the precious metal co-catalyst. And if you use this combination, then you have quite some drawbacks. One is titanium dioxide as a wide band gap semiconductor requires UV light, so it will not efficiently uh, use sunlight. Of course, the use of precious metals is expensive. And overall, the yields and rates were quite modest. So I think the proof of principle were, uh, was established, but with several drawbacks. Um, I would just like to mention also some um, newer work on the photoelectrochemical oxidation. It's not really on the polymers, but maybe some of the audience may, may find this interesting. So I will be very quick here. But there's quite some very quickly activity of developing photoelectrodes for organic conversions. And Joy here had a very early, um, very early, 2015, but to my knowledge, the first system where you had a business vendor date, um, N-type semiconductor photo anode, which use a tempo um, via a radical to in fact oxidize HMF, which is biomass derived. So HMF is hydroxymethyl sulfuryl, um, which is biomass derived molecule. And from there now, there's a lot of organic chemistry happening. And I think from the moment we can really effectively uh, pre-treat, depolymerize our substrates, photoelectrochemistry can also become an interesting approach for um, biomass reforming. So what was our entry, entry point? Um, we did not want to use a UV light absorber. We did not want to use precious metals. And we hoped for significant yields and, and a really proper active system. And when we were looking for photocatalysts, light absorbers, we came across this publication by the Feldman Group in Munich. And they had shown if you take cadmium sulfide quantum dots, so quantum dots means a size of a couple of nanometers, and you can dissolve them in an aqueous solution, they will form a nice um, colloidal solution. And if you bring these to an alkaline solution, they form this nice um, oxide hydroxide shell. And that's important because if you do photocatalysis with cadmium sulfide under more benign conditions, actually it will photo decompose or photo oxidize or photo corrode, however you want to say, quite quickly. So it will just precipitate as a, as a, as a black powder. 
but really being in the alkaline solution protects the cadmium sulfide. And you also form this oxide shell. And this oxide shell, um, we hoped in fact has similar property than the titanium dioxide shell and it's actually a decent catalyst, at least with radical conversion to convert some biomass. And since the Feldman group also has shown that you can reduce uh, water with this system, we thought, can we just use this as a photocatalyst in an alkaline aqueous solution, reducing protons and coupling this to the oxidation of, of some organic matter or ideally even biomass. And to jump straight into it, it worked. Um, we look here at uh, the rate of hydrogen expressed as millimoles per gram catalyst per hour and just showing the substrate. And all this means here, what this shows here is if we really use the polymeric alpha cellulose, hemicellulose, we obtain quite high activities. Um, the lignin much less so, simply because the alkaline solutions, of course, very nicely pretreat the cellulose, depolymerizing it, whereas the lignin is much tougher to work with. So the alkaline conditions are not just a nice protection layer for the cadmium sulfide, they also help us pretreating our cellulose. And this works for real world samples as well. The students got quite excited collecting grass from different colleges, collecting printer paper from waste bins, cardboard, etc. So you can see all sorts of lignocellulose or uh, comparable materials indeed to hydrogen. Here's just a video that illustrates how this works. This is a, a little piece of wood in a test tube. So the dimensions here are roughly maybe a centimeter. Then we have this yellow solution, yellow from the uh, cadmium sulfide quantum dots in the alkaline solution. And now this, this cadmium sulfide can nicely approach this wood and it starts evolving um, hydrogen. So you, you can see the bubbles uh, coming up. And this is just the beginning of the video. So as the video progresses, there will be larger bubbles. And this, this really visually works quite well. And of course, it even works better if the, the biomass is really pretreated and already a bit better suspended than just having a piece of solid wood in the system. So this uh, raised quite a bit of, of interest when we published our, our first report on this paper. So we were approached by Expo that was held in 2017 in, in Astana. And they were extremely keen to have a demonstration and we were equally keen. So there were discussions going of having a demonstrator system somewhere where just children could collect some grass samples and generate some hydrogen to really illustrate how simple the process is and really try to, to illustrate sustainable chemistry to children. But of course, at some point we came together and discussed the experimental requirements a bit. And then it, maybe we, we realized cadmium is not the, the most benign material for children to play with. But also I mentioned before the alkaline conditions. And if I mean alkaline, seriously alkaline. So here's the activity of hydrogen uh, and the molarity of potassium hydroxide. And 10 molar KOH is needed to really have very high activity. And again, this just relates to the uh, pretreatment solubilization of the cellulose and also protecting properly the cadmium sulfide. So nothing, not a good hands-on demonstration for children as an outreach system. So before we close on the cadmium sulfide and transition to non-toxic and more benign systems, we already found in our first system that indeed from the C13 NMR that we not only formed carbonate, of course the CO2 would be trapped as carbonate under this pH system, but also formate. So this in principle already showed the possibility to accumulate interesting organic molecules. Maybe not the most exciting one, but formate is still an interesting energy carrier. Um, there's development of even forming acid fuel cells and so it's, we were quite excited just to actually be able to detect significant amounts. And it was even the major product in the system. So I've pointed out the, the plus and negatives already. So the real motivation was getting away from basic conditions uh, and using non-toxic uh, cadmium, uh, using non-toxic system, system, sorry. And here we, we started to explore uh, carbon nitrides. And actually I thought that maybe um, Marcus would introduce carbon nitrides uh, before, but he, he did not. So I will just briefly say that this is an organic um, semiconductor-like material um, with really pioneering work, in fact, by, by Marcus Antonietti, and especially the seminal paper here in collaboration with Katsunori Dorman, really put carbon nitrides on the, on the map as a sustainable photocatalyst. And it had already been developed for, for organic systems. Then with, with this nice paper, it became relevant for water splitting. And now it's, it seems to be all over the place in, in the organic literature as a real replacement for uh, iridium or ruthenium dyes for sustainable chemistry. And we in the system use a, spe a, spe a particular variant of this carbon nitride with this NCN cyanamide functionality that was first reported here by Bettina Lodge. And this was worked by Hatice Kasappa and Christine Caputo. 
So what we found is we took this carbon nitride and already before we got into biomass, we became interested of exploring organic systems more broadly. And what uh, TJ uh, achieved here was actually a nice system where but upon photo excitation of carbon nitride, she could use these electrons to reduce protons to hydrogen with this molecular nickel bisdiphosphine catalyst. So this is a classical um, Du Bois catalyst with two phosphonate groups. And we found that this really forms a nice interface, in fact, of unknown nature, but it works really well in the system to make hydrogen. And the electrons can be sourced from classical sacrificial reagents, but also from the spencil alcohol that forms spencaldehyde. So now you could well say, well, benzyl alcohol is a known sacrificial reagent, but I would argue against it here, simply because we could show that we could re use really low amounts of benzyl alcohols, which means 30 micromole, and in the process convert this alcohol very cleanly with, with almost quantitative selectivity to the aldehyde in 70-80% yield. So it's not just sacrificial reagent where you form a range of different products and have huge excess of substrate, this is a proper clean stoichiometric conversion. Interesting in the context for this sacrificial and not, but in this case, I would argue against it. I think it's a clean transformation. It's not an interesting one, but it is an organic transformation. And we could track the formation of hydrogen and aldehyde over time here. And we can see indeed, as you would expect for both being two electron processes, a quite a nice one-to-one -one stoichiometry of these products forming. So we did quite a lot on this carbon nitride, uh, which I don't have time to talk about. So I want to get straight to the point with biomass. But since we saw that this oxidizes alcohols, we thought this should also be a nice photocatalyst then for glucose or cellulose substrates. And this is indeed what we saw. So initially to combine with cellulose, we were fairly unsuccessful because when we made our carbon nitrides, there were still heterogeneous proper powders that didn't really form a stable solution. But all we needed to do is really ultrasonicate this carbon nitride it, bro it broke it down into smaller fragments of hundreds of, of nanometer sizes, and this formed a nice, a pretty nice uh, suspension system. And now we could even use just a cellulose, polymeric cellulose under benign condition to form hydrogen. So the results are shown here. This is now hydrogen being produced with different substrates. And note now that we use phosphate buffer at pH four and a half. So we are not using pH uh, 14 plus anymore. And you can see, of course, the solubilized monomeric and dimeric substrate, cellobios, glucose, or silos, galactose, uh, perform better than the insoluble ones, but still we could even reform cellulose and xylane, or hemicellulose in this case, and even a little bit, at least of synopyl alcohol, a soluble version of lignin. So this showed in principle, with the right catalyst, and ideally a, a soluble catalyst, and the right interface, we can probably just photoreform directly insoluble substrates in the solution. And that's what we started to explore further. So I would still concern, uh, um, consider the carbon nitrides as semi-heterogeneous, but then we looked at a different type of carbon light absorbers. And these are known as carbon nanodots. So this, um, you can see here on the top right, how they look like nanodots because they have dimensions of three to 10 nanometers. And we make them from pyrolysis, um, essentially of organics. So citric acid would be one example or aspartic acid if you want to dope them with nitrogen but you can also make them by just pyrolysis of cellulose. So in this case, using biomass to make these nanodots that we actually then use to photoreform the biomass. So you can really see how sustainable this chemistry becomes. And depending on the, on the pyrolysis temperature, um, they can either be amorphous, if you use lower temperature of maybe 180 degrees, and if you go higher, they really become nicely graphitic, what you can see here by the TM image with the fringes nicely shown. So the idea was now, um, with these photocatalysts that we have, have been developing for uh, a couple of years. In fact, this was worked by um, um, Martindale, Benjamin Martindale. He, he really brought them to the lab with uh, Georgina Hutton. We could, we could show that these carbon dots are really nice photocatalysts under sacrificial conditions to make hydrogen um, with this nickel catalyst. So Demetra took on this work to show that we can indeed also use this for biomass conversion. And well, this is just how we make them. I've, I've mentioned this before. And here's the bigger picture, and we can see now the hydrogen um, amounts versus substrates, and you can see with the different uh, particles or light absorbers, now there's not too much difference anymore between soluble um, biomass and really insoluble biomass. There seems to be a really good interaction after proper stirring of this photocatalyst with the biomass that really result in, in fairly decent yields. We're quite excited about this soluble form for photoreforming. Um, yeah, I think I do have time. So we'll just quickly summarize also from a mechanistic point how this works. Um, 
what we believe is really, really essential. Again, it goes back to kinetics. So if you take these carbon dots and you photo excite them, you have different photo excited states and they relax on a time scale from picosecond to seconds. So there's some very long lift systems in there. If we have an efficient um, electron, electron donor or a system that's easy to oxidize, then this will be the preferred substrate. So we do, really look at the reductive quenching process where the donor like triacinal amine, for example, is being oxidized we end up with a reduced carbon dot that can then reduce the nickel catalyst and upon reduction or two reductions, we can form the hydrogen. If we don't have a suitable or um, a highly reactive electron donor, and we would consider this, for example, for the, bio, the, the cellulose, especially when it's still insoluble, then we form this fairly long-lived photoexcited state that's still long-lived enough to, in fact, oxidatively quench now with the nickel catalyst forming the reduced state, which can then make the hydrogen. And then you accumulate this oxidized carbon dots, which effectively in the dark can start reacting with the donor. So this oxidative quenching, we don't have definite proof, but I believe this is really essential to access this difficult insoluble substrates. And once, and we are seeing this, once we have partially broken them down, we can actually go through the much quicker reductive quenching pathway and much more accelerate our hydrogen production. So there's some kinetic tricks, tricks here enabled by two quenching pathways in the system. And this was collaboration with, with James Durant. I should have mentioned before, um, this was actually a collaboration also with the Max Planck Institute from Antonietti with Alexander Savatev here, who did some of the analysis for us. Okay, and the last uh, example I wanna show on biomass, and I'm, this, this just came out online and it's work by Erwin Lahm, I'm, I'm really happy about. Uh, and it really shows that we can simultaneously convert two waste streams, biomass on the oxidative side on CO2 reduction, um, well, on the, on the reductive side, and it's, it's also incredible because Erwin Lam joined my laboratory in March 2020, which arguably was not a great time to, st to start a postdoc. And given that the lab was shut 50% for a year, it's incredible that he got all of this done already. So that the challenge he took on is for us to actually reduce CO2, we really require neutral pH. Um, if you operate under highly alkaline conditions, you trap all the CO2 as carbonate. If you're highly um, acidic, means you just bubble out your CO2, which means it's actually quite difficult then for you to, to work with biomass if you don't have a, a depolymerization step. So the second one is again, under neutral pH, you have insoluble, insoluble biomass. So the, the first step for us was actually to look at the photocatalyst system that could reduce CO2. And in fact, there are not that many systems and the one we settled for was, it looks like a, in a way the trivial system, but it's not. So we, we use titanium dioxide as a light absorber. So the limitation here, again, it's a UV light absorber, but here it's just about showing the chemistry. Uh, but the tricky thing is reducing CO2 with titanium is very difficult because the driving force you have is only about 200 millivolts and you really need a very efficient um, uh, catalyst. And the one we identified, in fact, from previous work by Chen Leung here is these cobalt bisterpridine catalysts. They have been known for quite a long time, but the surprising finding we had is if actually you phosphonate them and you put them on a surface, the mechanism changes. And this change in mechanism um, results that you only need to go to the cobalt one rather than the cobalt zero state. So you can access cobalt a catalysis with cobalt one, which is sufficient for with the driving force of titania. And in fact, this is the first system here on titania that shows you two reduction with a molecular co-catalyst. Um, if you wonder about the mechanism here, because this looks like a completely saturated cobalt center, what we believe, and we have a lot of evidence from spectroscopy, is that both terpyridines stay connected and only one pyridine upon reduction opens up a vacant site. So one pyridine um, decoordinates, opens a vacant site for CO2 to come in and do the catalysis. So he showed that this system works under sacrificial conditions first with triacinal amine. Then the question was how to replace this triacinal amine uh, by biomass. And here, in fact, we use quite a simple trick. So we just use cellulose. We knew we have to be at neutral pH, and that's fantastic for biology. So we just take some cellulases, so enzymes that can depolymerize cellulose. These break this down to cellulose and glucose. And now we can just feed this to the titanium dioxide and convert the substrates to arabinose and actually in particular formate in this case. And that's the whole system, how it looks like. So we photoexcite titania. Electrons flow with little driving force, but still sufficient for this molecular co-catalyst to reduce carbon dioxide and water to carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So it's actually syngas. And then we can source the electrons from the glucose cellulose bios following the depolymerization 
with cellulase and we form this arabinose and the format in solution. So there was one interesting finding. This is the table and I just would like to go to entry two. So if we use this pretreated cellulose in this system, I've shown before that we form carbon monoxide, hydrogen and formate. And it's interesting to see that we really form this very nicely in the one-to-one -one ratio. If we look at CO hydrogen, so the products from the reduction and the product from oxidation. And so an incredibly clean system, which we were happy to see. But the immediate question is with all these substrates flowing around carbon dioxide, glucose, et cetera, how do you know that actually you form the CO from the reduction and the form it from the oxidation? And this just comes in from isotopic labeling. So if you label uh, your system with C13 labeled glucose and leave the normal C12 CO2, then you will see indeed you form C12 CO and you form the formate from the C13 and you see this nice split here. And the same is true for the opposite. If you don't label only the CO2 and not the glucose, you see C13 CO2 with the expected envelope and you see only the expected singlet signal from the proton NMR for the formate. So we have very clear proof um, from the isotopic labeling that the reduction is completely clean to see or completely clean, I would say 95% clean to CO and the oxidation only generates the formate. So this is where we are with the biomass. And in the last 10 minutes of my talk, I would just like to talk about plastics. And also here, Markus has already shown very, a couple of very nice um, pictures. And I would just like to show here the lack of circularity we have in the use of plastic at the moment. So we look at the primary production and these numbers here are in million, ton, million metric tons. We have produced probably today nine, nine billion tons um, of plastics. And of course, the vast majority from fossil fuels. So from this, about two and a half billion tons are still in use. Um, then from the, that has been used and has been disposed of, 0 0.1 billion tons have been recycled. Oh, sorry, 0 0.6 billion tons have been recycled, 0 0.1 billion tons a second time. And it's about 0 0.1 billion tons in secondary use. But you can see that a vast amount really has been discarded in landfills or simply been incinerated. So it's, it's a linear economy. And if we want to keep using these plastics, we have to introduce circularity and effectively recycle or upcycling, ideally all of it. So our approach here was very much the same as for biomass. So we saw plastics not so much as a culprit. I mean, the, the reality is it is just not really used well. And it's in a way, it's a victim of its own success. It's just too cheap. So people are not appreciating it and just throwing it out. But as a chemist, if you look at plastics, you look at an extremely valuable resource um, in terms of energy content, I mean, to some extent, it's just another form of fossil fuel, um, but also highly chemistry rich, right? You have all sorts of different polymers. So it's hundreds of different polymers that are being used. And uh, Taylor Uckert here started this work. And the idea is the same as before with the cellulose. So I can go a bit quicker than before. Instead of feeding now the biomass or even the water oxidation originally, the idea is just to use plastic waste as a way to source electrons with the hope to form some organics here on the way to produce the hydrogen. And here again, the first system um, we introduced was the, the cadmium sulfide under the alkaline conditions forming the oxide shell. And I will just talk about this little video here on the left. So what you see here again is this test tube. Um, and now there's a slice of PET water bottle, right? That's just being put into the test tube. But before putting it into the test tube, actually we coated it with this cadmium sulfide photocatalyst. And if you take it in and expose it to light, you can see now all these bubbles of hydrogen coming out. So exactly the same as before with this uh, piece of wood, the cadmium sulfide starts eating into the PET, which means chemically speaking, oxidizing the PET and releasing the electrons by the cogeneration of the hydrogen. So I think it's a very nice illustration how the systems work. But you can also see that this is not an overly efficient system, right? So we will probably take us weeks to consume all of this PT or even longer at the moment. So here you can see a little bit the type of plastics we can convert. Um, a polylactic acid also discussed in the previous lecture, um, PET, polyethylene terephthalate is, is good, a real bottle or just pure PET. Uh, polyurethane is a possibility, uh, a bit less efficient, and that's more or less at the moment the plastic we're looking at. So this really means condensation polymers. And the stability, same for the biomass, it's quite stable. So usually we run these experiments for about a week and stop afterwards, but the systems are, are still active afterwards. Um, conversion yields, usually if we go to relatively, but still fair substrate concentrations, we look at 30% conversion yields. So that, that's quite 
um, respectable. So it's not just a percent, a fraction that we break down. It is really a meaningful amount of the, of the polymers. So how does the chemistry work? And this is, shows you how simple the chemistry in fact is again. So with PET, a copolymer, we break it down into terephthalate uh, plus the acetylene glycol. The terephthalate precipitates under the condition, which means there's a possibility uh, to separate it and recycle it. And then what we're really converting is the acetylene glycol. And then with acetylene glycol, you form this whole range of different products uh, going from for formate, glycolate, ethanol, acetate, lactate. And you can also see a little bit of this uh, terephthalate here. This is just an isomer, isos isophthalate, in fact. And this is only here as a filler. So this is not a new product that has come from isomerization. This has just already been in the PET before. And you can see the system works and we can extract all the hydrogen, but unfortunately the organic products are still a mess. So of course, ideally we would like to have a clean conversion into one um, interesting product selectively. Also here we moved on. So instead of uh, by using the carbon nitrides I've shown before, now instead of using this quite fragile molecular catalyst, um, we found following in a work by, by, by Thomas and Dries here, that you can also deposit nickel phosphide and nickel phosphide is a known hydrogen evolution catalyst. And since this forms a nice solid solid interface here, we actually have a much more phot robust photocatalytic system that you can easily separate and reuse. So recyclability of the photocatalytic system is important to us. And this here would be a very nice example where we can just centrifuge off our carbon nitride and reuse it many, many times for photo reforming in this case. And then we also start thinking slowly about scaling. Um, when I say scaling, this really comes from an academic laboratory. Um, we, we look here at 10 centimeter, maybe diameter. The solution has about 150 milliliters, but also these systems here um, photoreform equally well. You can see the hydrogen yield. Um, what we have in here is polyester microfiber, which of course is great for us because it's quite well suspended in the solution, but you can also use bottle. And the particular strength here is we can use contaminated waste. So if we, if we have some soybean oil on the PET, it's not really a, a, a a major issue, it still works to some extent. And I've just mentioned scaling. So we have been working quite extensively with OMV. Um, OMV is a now branded hydrocarbon company, which means formerly oil and gas company headquartered in Vienna. And they have also particular interest in plastic recycling. It's the same as BSF and also other companies, but we, we have, have been working with OMV on this. And they just launched recently a pilot plant, which is the re-oil facility. And effectively what they're doing is they're, they're using, in this case, polymers in a thermal process to produce some crude oil. And they are producing hundreds of kilograms, or they can produce already 100 kilograms of plastic from one liter of oil, and they can do this um, per hour. So the question is, you know, why would someone bother with this tiny scale, inefficient solar-driven process if industry already can work on this significant scale and with the step soon of real applications and feeding this into the waste processing industry. So the reason is that these two processes are completely complementary. So the re-oil facility can in fact only use addition polymers and they rely on highly purified waste streams. So this means in their system, they can only use polyethylene, polypropylene, et cetera. If you have uh, contaminations, this is a real issue for their process. So they cannot really use them and it would actually inhibit their system and require probably cleaning, et cetera. Whereas in our system, it's the complete opposite. So at the moment, we are really bad with addition polymers. Simply, we, we, have, we have not a good handle to access them or break them down. So we use these condensation polymers that are not being useful for the real system, as I mentioned before, like, like PLA, P, uh, PLA or PET, et cetera. So the, the idea is really here to develop this complementary that we can use plastics that are currently not being used for or cannot be, be recycled by processes that are being in development. Um, also here we are going towards continuous flow. So if we found maybe always uh, centrifuging off our particles, reusing is not the most efficient. And we also need to think about processing much more. And for continuous processing, really flow, I think is the way forward. And what we've done here is you can simply deposit um, your light absorbers, your carbon nitrides on, in this case, glass panels. And then you have these glass panels. That's an example with five times five centimeter. You integrate them in a little flow device, and then you constantly pretreat your polymer solution, purge it into your flow reactor, break it down with sunlight, and purge it off. And essentially, you don't. You just keep your um, panel intact, and once it's being degraded, although you've not reached that point, you can just replace it with a with a new panel, hopefully recycling the old panel. 
And this works, again, here showing the hydrogen yield versus uh, time, a couple of days, we have quite good activity. And it's also, as I mentioned before, not very sensitive. So even if we do the chemistry not in pure water, we can use seawater, we can use contaminated plastic. It's quite a robust system. And in fact, what we've been using here is real municipal solid waste. So it's actually not a purified waste, it's a true um, um, waste stream. So all our activities on the plastic front have actually led to a center here um, in Cambridge that was introduced already before. And that's the Cambridge Creative Circular Plastic Center. And effectively what we wanna do here is a create community that thinks about circularity uh, much more broadly and with an example on, on plastics. So we have 10 academic members that are all shown here. And I think it's, it's an amazing uh, example where people from different backgrounds can come together addressing the same problem with very different approaches. So it's not just chemistry. You can see departments here, not just from the physical uh, sciences or engineering, but also from humanities, uh, economics, et cetera. And it has been a real a fruitful activity so far, and I hope we, we can expand this soon in the future. So what we're doing is we have all these multidisciplinary projects. Um, Utilization is one of them where I will fall in. In the stream of research is always, for example, also for example, using plastic waste for 3D printing. Um, we have a stream of research where we look of replacing synthetic uh, polymers with bio-derived polymers, for example, cellulose-derived um, plastics. Um, we look at uh, plastics flows, where is plastic being produced is known, but where does it really end up? And also we look at uh, social behavior of plastics and actually um, techno-economical analysis. And this brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I just wanted to introduce really this concept of using waste, of, in particular polymeric waste as a substrate for solar chemistry. You may still be with the question, and at least I am still after all these years, so what really is our entry point? How can we use this and what are the real benefits? And we have been brainstorming through a range of different uh, networks. And here are just a, a few bullet points where I think that the solar approaches that I've shown have an advantage. So first, compared to the thermal approaches, we can not only use the mixed waste, but we can also use in particular wet waste. So there's very often humidity, especially in biomass. And if you have a thermal reactor, of course, you get a huge energy penalty if you have to evaporate all of this water first. So for us, it doesn't make a difference. The biomass can be completely wet, wet. there's not an issue there. Uh, small and off-grid applications. So I do not really see any scaling limitations for our system, meaning it can only operate off-grid and at very small decentralized sites, which I think will become very important in the future. Um, I've not mentioned this before, but the hydrogen we're producing is, we believe, is very clean, which means from our GC traces, we cannot really see any carbon monoxide or other impurities. And that's quite important for applications, because if you want to use your hydrogen in a fuel cell, meaning a hydrogen fuel cell, um, you'd really need fuel cell grade hydrogen. And from any sort of steam reforming, you have huge amounts of carbon monoxide as contaminants. And we hope to demonstrate soon that we can actually source straight away this hydrogen to run a fuel cell. Um, this potentially even allows very different type of applications. So clean cooking is a, a massive um, challenge in developing countries. So there are about three to four million people um, passing away each year from dirty cooking, if you like, where people just, in fact, burn off the, the, the biomass or coal, etc., cetera, um, to heat or to cook. And in this case, if we could find a very clean way to make hydrogen off-grid on a small scale in developing locations, then there may be the possibility actually to have some clean cooking facilities since we have no contaminants in here. Um, another way how to source value or to valorize your system. Yes, of course, we want to make uh, money ultimately from our products, but there's also value in removal expensive waste. And the one that would come to mind is clinical waste, as an example. So your PPE equipment, for example, you could, you could potentially um, remove here. And ultimately, I criticized a lot the alkaline conditions. And we very actively work to replace alkalinity and to have really a benign neutral pH system. But actually, many of the waste streams are already highly alkaline. So for example, if you go to paper mill effluents, their streams are alkaline. And we, we could probably also just use them straight away in our process. Okay, so this is the end of my talk. I'm, I'm reasonably on time. Um, I've, I've shown the, the, the few collaborators we had along the way. This has been quite new. So in fact, we didn't even have time to establish too many collaborations and we hope to expand this now very, very quickly and to work closely with the community. Um, the funding bodies are sheer, shown here on the top. Here, a couple of, of group pictures over the years. I've mentioned the main contributors in the presentation. And last but not least, I used the opportunity for an advertisement 
um, for two upcoming conferences. They're not quite on, um, on waste conversion, but still on sustainability. The first one, in fact, is next week. So if anyone is interested, you can still register. It's very cheap. And it's the Chemical Science Symposium on Biohybrid Approaches to Sustainable Energy Conversion, where you can see the speakers list here. And then this will be online. And next year, we hope to organize in Cambridge an in-person meeting at St. John's College on biophotoelectrochemistry, also for sustainable chemistry. Okay, that's all I have to say. So thanks a lot for your attention and happy um, to take any, any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Erwin. Very nice uh, lecture, very motivating and inspiring. Uh, of course, I have uh, questions, but before that, I I am going straight forward to the uh, let's say uh, Q and A session. So there is a question from Robin Gioret, and his question is regarding the quantum dot CDS. Does the oxide layer impact the light absorbing and redox properties of the quantum dot? Uh, the, the, so the, the cadmium oxide on the cadmium sulfide. Uh, yes, so yes, no, it does not because this is a, a, a meta stable, extremely thin shell of cadmium oxide. It's only a few atoms thick. Mm -hmm. So it, it will, we do not expect this in any way to interfere with the light. And in fact, if you look at the quantum dot size before and after radiation uh, or exposure to the alkaline condition, it's almost unchanged. So we really look at an extremely thin shell of cadmium oxide. And the second question is from Sanjay Nagarajan. What would be the concentration of the biomass that was used to generate hydrogen? This is at pH 4.5 with the buffer? Yes, so usually what we use is in, in the range of, of 10 to 20 milligrams per milliliter, to give you an idea. Mm -hmm. So so, of, of course, so I think it's, it's an important comment. So what we, what we try to do is, so, so ultimately you need to optimize your metrics to some extent. Um, and there's always the temptation to go to extremely low concentrations. And the temptation is because, of course, then the conversion yields look amazing. So, and, and we found at this concentration, at least a few milligrams per milliliter, um, it, it's still meaningful amounts of, of substrates um, and the conversion yields are also decent. So it's, on the other hand, it becomes dangerous if you go to too high concentrations and your conversion yields drop down to 0.5%, then often you don't know anymore if you've just converted some impurity or actually the biomass. So if anyone getting into, we've been thinking quite a lot about this and we have optimized it for our system roughly at this concentration I've just mentioned. So this does not mean we could not use higher concentrations. Of course, also light blockage and, and scattering becomes an issue, but it is really um, to have a, a concentration where I feel we can report the, the most meaningful output parameters. And he has another question. While mass transfer and contact between the catalyst and biomass can be increased using quantum dots, what about the light penetration in the solution? Mm -hmm. Did the heterogeneous biomass in the bulk not shield the light reaching yeah. the photocatalyst? So, so that, yeah, that, this is what I mentioned just before. So yes, so if, if you go too high, it will just shield it. So this is, um, I've, I've, I think one solution to this, and that's what, what we mainly use now are these panels. So if you have this uh, panel, what we do is, so uh, let me just go bring up this slide quickly again. I, uh, I just explained it. So you have this panel and, and here's the reactor. So effectively what you can do is the temptation would be you just irradiate through the solution to hit the panel. But I mentioned that actually we have deposited the photocatalyst on top of a glass substrate. So actually we can introduce this panel, irradiate from the back through the glass and expose the carbon nitride. So what catalyst we are using with light without passing through the substrate at all. So this means in this configuration, it doesn't really matter what concentration you're working with, you, you can get around the problem of light scattering from the biomass. So this means, of course, also what you're introducing then is some mass transport issues. And that's why um, pretreatment becomes so important. But if you have a, a reasonable pretreatment system for a, a neutral pH like cellulase we're using or go to the extreme pHs, it is really sufficiently broken down to intact quite well if you have a thin stream with these photocatalyst panels. So long story short, there's an engineering solution to this. Thank you, Erwin. And now, actually, I have several questions. I just try to phrase it uh, one after another. My first question is, when I saw that you are comparing the, let's say, different reactivity of, let's say, cellulose and lignin, and I always see that lignin was the least reactive. So I was just wondering, because, let's say, for the balance band activation, lignin should behave okay, similar like cellulose, because it has hydroxy group, and that should not be a barrier. Then yep. 
what is the actual reason actually? It's, it's mainly the, the solubility. Okay. And uh, so I have to say we have, we, we are only, we've only started maybe a year ago to address lignin more seriously. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not because I was not aware that lignin is the, is, the, is the bigger problem and actually the most important one. It was simply for us, we wanted to get, to get into the chemistry. Mm -hmm. and, and we felt with cellulose that's much easier, simply because the pretreatment and depolymerization is much easier, as I've shown as well. Mm -hmm. I think now our attention is much more um, on lignin, meaning at, at, at ways to break the CC bonds, etc. And that's chemistry we are pursuing. In fact, not really trying to solubilize, but having straightaway homogeneous systems that actually have, a high, I think, a high affinity to the substrate is important. And then, of course, the catalytic control to break the bond where you want it. Does ionic or can ionic liquid help you? Yeah, <laughs> yes, we have, we have uh, one one story that was not so successful. Uh, uh, okay. uh, but the, so the reason the problem is with ionic liquids is you need to find the right photocatalyst. Yes. And the photocatalysts we use at the moment is the 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 quite strong oxidants. Mm -hmm. And with this oxidative power, despite ionic liquids always being claimed to be super stable, which they are, but our under our photocatalytic conditions, we often find that you break down more of the ionic liquid than actually the, the polymer you want to uh, decompose. So I'd say we, we have seen very strong evidence. We do see some conversion of biomass, but you know we're not going to publish a system where actually the, we break down 80% or more of ionic liquids and mm -hmm. just a fraction of our polymer. So we, we, we keep working on it. We've just put it a bit on the side for now, but mm -hmm. this was the problem we faced. And my second question. Can, can I just add one one yeah, uh, one comment too? The one system we have where we used uh, an alternative solvent is metal salt hydrates. Mm -hmm. So lithium bromide in particular, so where it's almost more salt than water, yeah, yeah, yeah. and these are really stable. Um, in this system, we could depolymerize and actually show the conversion as a pretreatment. But then, it, it's not really a particularly sustainable system either. Mm -hmm. So if you have these hydrates, uh, I think it's fine. But then you have to think about solvent recycling. But that's that's a that's a way to get around this this at least stability issue we found with ionic liquids. And my second question is that I mean beautiful work with this uh, let's say utilization of plastic or let's say depolymerization of plastic. But what I saw the plastic is you have taken the PET type mm -hmm. plastic, and what normally people say yeah uh, that PET has a functional group, so it could be easier to depolymerize in other way let's say with hydrogenation or other functional group. What would be your thought actually towards, let's say, polyethylene or polypropylene or polystyrene? Do you think that can be also utilized in yeah. the same manner that you have done? So, so we have one system. I've just not. I, I'm quite excited about. It. I've just not put it into the the presentation because it's a bit of a detour. Uh, the chemistry changes, and so what you can do is um, with with polypropylene, polyethylene, is you can. Uh, chemically oxidize it first with an acid. So nitric acid would be a, a standard one. Mm -hmm. And then once you have the dye acids, then you can easily electrocatalytically or photocatalytically um, mm -hmm. convert it. So it's actually depending on the catalytic system, um, we always form uh, gases, hydrocarbons, which means either acetylene or ethane, depending on the catalytic process. The big drawback at the moment from a sustainability point of view, in my view, is the, is the stoichiometric use of, of sulfuric acid as, as oxidant. Yeah. Yes. So, on, oh, sorry, nit nitric acid is actually what we use. Strong acid. So this, yeah, so, so if, if, if you go into the literature, you can find all sorts of excuses and say, you know, there's, there's a lot of nitric acid waste from the electronics industry, but mm. still, I'm, I'm not very happy with it. But it, it's a way for us to go into conversion of, of this addition polymers. Yeah, and some people also use sulfuric acid, very strong sulfuric yeah. acid. Yeah, so that's, exactly. I agree with you. Yeah. That that's the kind of a so, so that, that that's the trick to depolymerize or at least or depolymer at least to break them down and, and then you have soluble fragments and then you can do the chemistry but it's as i said i'm, I'm personally more passionate about the development of of carbon so carbon materials soluble carbon materials carbon dots in particular tune the affinity to the substrate and then having them ideally do some selective chemistry on the selective chemistry we're still very far away mm. but i think we are finding more and more ways uh, for high affinity and it goes a bit what Marco said before, you know, empathelicity, etc. There are many ways to tune the properties of these materials. Yeah. And then and once you have really nice interface, then the chemistry becomes possible. Yes, yes. exactly. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I do see uh, Adam has a question. Adam, please. Yes. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Evan, for this great talk. Um, I have a question to the carbon nanodots, which you use as, let's say, photosensitized or semiconductor in a specific way. Mm -hmm. um, what is the role of a carbon nanodots? How can you kind of <laughs> yes. affect the efficiency? Or can I envision this like, you know, like photoelectrodes where you have a semiconductor and then you do the CVD of a catalyst 
And it's like more about the charge transfer or is there uh, what is you, the most important you, thing? You, you meant exactly what, what's behind, or what's the properties of the carbon dots and why they're photocatalysts, how to tune them? Yes, how, or how do they affect the efficiency? Or the ah, okay, 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 okay. So mm -hmm. what we have actually spent quite a few years to look into this. So for me, carbon dots, I think it goes straight to your question, um, but it's also more a view from a molecular chemist. I'm a bit of a disappointment because I don't really fully understand what they are and why they work the way they do. Um, what, so as I mentioned before, they all have dimensions from three to nine, 10 nanometers. We can tune the dimensions relatively well. Um, we can tune the amorphous behavior, crystallinity and dope them. And what we found, and a lot of credit goes here to James Durant who the, did all the trains in absorption spectroscopy, is amorphous carbon dots. Um, essentially, we see them more as a conglomerate of a couple of molecular uh, uh, fluorophoric units, if you like. But, uh, and, and so the, the, the properties are much more difficult to predict and we see quite short-lived photoexcited states. So they're actually not particularly good photocatalysts. Um, when we go to the graphitic variants, I think then it becomes much more semiconductor-like, also semiconducting-like properties, probably approaching more something like the carbon nitrides. And I'm really not an, an expert materials chemist in this space. Um, but this means what we see with the uh, crystalline behavior is the light absorption goes up quite significantly. Of course, the, the crystalline materials. And we also just, we see longer lived charge separated states. What really then makes the, the, the final difference is the doping. So when we start introducing nitrogen, or I mean, actually it's quite nitrogen enriched systems, there are the, a couple of percent, then we see the same light absorption behaviors for the crystalline carbon dots, but the nitrogen doping really hope, um, helps the charge separation. So the lifetime of charge is just decreases significantly. And we have actually produced I wouldn't say a hundred, but not too far off of different doped uh, carbon dots. And what we found, and we've never published this we, we, because it's, it was not rigorous enough, but from this quite qualitative, if I can say this, quite an interesting behavior of nitrogen doping. So there was a clear, it looked like a, a volcano plot to some extent where this aspartic acid we have on the top is the ideal nitrogen level. As you go on both sides, it actually just drops down towards the, the just graphitic behavior. So long story short, graphitization helps light absorption, which means high activity. Doping improves charge separation, thereby increasing the activity. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Maybe one question more, if I can. Yeah. Ah. Or maybe Robert, please, please. Oh, okay. So then I go first. So, uh, so thanks also from my side for this very impressive talk. So as an electrochemist, uh, I'm, I'm very fascinated because uh, both half cell reactions. Um, appear or occur at the same particle. Uh, so, so in theory, of course, or, or practically also, you can run these reactions uh, separated in the paired electrolysis. This is clear. And then these uh, half cell reactions uh, have been carried out and are optimized. So, so what, is, what is your take uh, on this uh, when you compare those two methodologies for your application for the mm -hmm. depolymerization? What is the more promising technology in the future? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? You, you mean photocatalysis versus mm -hmm. electrocatalysis? Yeah, in, in this context here of, of your of your yeah. chemistry. So, so I think just straight away one disadvantage, and that's why we have not so far done too much of electrochemistry, is of course you have your solid electrode. So what I mentioned before, the big mm -hmm. advantage, what, what we want to develop is this homogeneous photocatalyst that can actually diffuse or approach mm -hmm. the, the, the insoluble substrate to break it down. This is not something you can do by electrochemistry. I think the huge value in electrochemistry is, of course, once you have an efficient depolymerization step, there's no reason why you cannot do the chemistry I've shown by electrochemistry. And I think people are, are doing that. Um, Nevertheless, even if we are going at the moment more down the, the photocatalysis route, I just think it's, it's, it's less explored, but we still rely heavily on electrochemistry. So uh, I've emphasized, I think a few times at the moment, the big challenge is to develop selective catalysts. And to do this all integrated on one particle, as you mentioned, with both half reactions occurring, you, you don't have proper control. So this means for all this catalyst development we are doing, we always start off electrochemically. So we, we try to develop first an, an anode cathode, depending what chemistry you want to do, the catalyst. And then the idea is always after optimizing this half reactions and integrating this into the photocatalytic system. So for, um, I would not see them separate. I, I think, well, I would say electrochemistry does not, know, does not need photocatalysis, but I still think the photocatalysis strongly relies on the electrochemistry. That's an interesting view. Thanks. I, I agree, Erwin. Hmm. Absolutely agree. Yeah, Adam, you wanted to ask one thing? Yes. Um, I wanted to know your opinion if it comes to flow photoelectrochemistry, because in terms of lignin, you have this big kind of light absorption, so you have also a small efficiency. 
if you make like a microflow reactor, for example, and you kind of code the, the walls with a photo cathode, for instance, or a photo anode, do you think this is an approach to get a higher efficiency for these reactions in the future? As, um, so uh, we've, so we, we do work on, on some holocore fiber or a small system, but I always find, I've never found a good way to code these, these fibers or systems with our catalysts. But let's say that this can, but I'm also not an expert, but let's say this, this can be solved. So at the moment, I think, especially if you want to go to real world waste, the issue is then clogging of your capillaries or systems or your, your fibers. So of course you can then tune the dimensions. Um, mass transfer becomes of course an advantage. Yeah, I don't know where the ideal dimensions are. So it's, I'm not sure if you're aware of, so the, the Katsunari Doman, he works on this water splitting panels. And I found it quite interesting that, so essentially what they're doing, they have um, photocatalyst sheets where a pair of semiconductors, they really can produce 100 square meters. There was just a paper in Nature last week. And they put business vanadate and strontium titanate on top and these huge panels um, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. What I had never realized is how thin the water layer is. So it's about one millimeter. Mm. And I, I've, I'm sure they have been thinking quite extensively about the ideal um, dimension. So going to your, to your question, Maybe this is the, the one, two, three millimeter up to one centimeter, really the maximum of steps anyway we can afford. And then of course the dimensions of these flow systems become very relevant. I've, I've, I've not, I cannot give you a precise number. I'm just aware of clogging with real world waste will be a huge issue. But, but if, you, if there's if an effective filtration step or anything, then I think ultimately we need to go to quite thin systems anyway. Okay. Thank you very much for the answer. Erwin, I don't see any further questions. So if this is the case, then I would like to thank you for your very inspiring lecture, for the very nice discussion, and thanks for your time as well to give us all the, uh, let's say, all the answers and to educate us about photocatalysis. Thank you very much. That, that being said, it would have been nice, like how did we celebrate in Gottingen in the evening, but as this is virtual, so we can make it, but we hope that in near future, we will sit with a couple of beers. Sorry, Marcus is here, so probably we need to switch to whiskey. That's fine. Uh, Marcus, you are muted. You are muted. I'm a wine drinker. I love oh, wine. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I drink everything, but I oh, love okay. wine. So, but, but also since, since we have done the lectures already, we can just need to drink wine and whiskey, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fantastic. And then, uh, I thank you to both Marcus as well as Erwin for your very kind time as well as very nice discussions and all very inspiring lecture. And with this, we wish you a very nice evening and hope to see you soon. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Erwin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.